Let us pray. Holy One, as we stand humbly before you, may thy words only be spoken and thy words only be heard. Amen. Please be seated. We've been looking, as you know, at the book of Mark for the last few weeks, but this morning I just can't let that book of Job pass without some comments. Over the last three weeks, we've caught a glimpse of the book from the readings, a book that goes to the heart of human pain, that speaks of, quote, how God endures it, how Job endures it, cries out of it, wrestles furiously with God in the midst of it, and ultimately transcends his pain, or better, is transformed by it. The book that echoes the human cry throughout history, one of the arguments that's proffered when we speak about God, yes, but why does your God allow suffering? If allow be the word. But it's also the book about holding on to God in the midst of unimaginable pain. In her book, Getting Involved with God, which I highly recommend, Professor Ellen Davis writes, from this book, that is the book of Job, above all others in scripture, we learn that the person in pain is a theologian of unique authority. And she continues, the sufferer who keeps looking for God has in the end privileged knowledge. The one who complains to God, pleads with God, rails at God, does not let God off the hook for a minute. She is at last admitted to a mystery. She passes through a door that only pain will open and is thus qualified to speak of God in a way that others, whom we generally call more fortunate, cannot speak. I have not experienced the devastating pain of loss that Job suffers but I know that there are those here who have. And I have walked with some of you and many others who have been plunged into a place of dread, a place that I certainly dread. But through it all, their faith has remained intact, albeit changed. And I know that I have much to learn from them. I remember a woman whom I used to visit, she suffered from very severe depression and she had done for years and she told me the, the book of Job was the, the book that she went back to again and again. It was for her a source of comfort and solace. Now you will recall perhaps that the book begins with a conversations in the heavenlies. The Lord points out Job as this great example, a man of integrity, blameless, upstanding, upright, fearing the Lord and turning from evil. And Satan, his cynical adversary, says in effect, well, yeah, of course, but look how you've blessed him. Look what you've given him. Take away everything from him. Give him terrible disease, and then we'll see how long he stands upright. And astonishingly, God says, okay, but spare his life. This isn't quite the image of God that we normally have, is it? It's something of a problem. Here again, I turn to Professor Ellis for her wisdom. She says that Satan's challenge bites at the core issue of covenant faith, covenant faith of Israel, of us, namely a relationship between God and humanity that is based on love and transcends self-interest on either side. We love not out of self-interest. Something to think about. But how do we respond when things go terribly wrong in our lives? After all, if we're Christians, it sort of gives us a hedge of protection, isn't it supposed to? But when tragedy hits, when illness hits, when we are threatened with financial ruin, with seemingly insurmountable loss, who are the friends who come to sit with us on the morning bench. Job's response initially is to tear his clothes and fall to the ground and worship, and then he stops and is in silence. 
His inconsolable wife cries out, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. I always feel that Job's wife gets short shrift in the book, don't you? For she too has had to suffer the loss of all of her children, all of her children killed. And her husband, covered in sores, wrapped up in his own grief, his desire for justice, his loathing for his own life. He's not there to comfort her. He's not there to hold her when she sobs through the night. Instead, she gets a rebuke. You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Job will get a similar rebuke from God when God eventually speaks. But Job, like his wife, like all of us, has much to learn about the character of God. But he knows something, for he says, shall we receive the good at the hands of God and not receive the bad? His dear friends, when they hear of his hardship, God bless them, come and sit with him for seven days and nights, sitting Shiva, it's called, to this day. They sit in silence with him. There's lots going on inside their heads, you may imagine. And when at last they began to speak, Job first pours out words. He pours out the pain and the grief in his heart and he rails. He curses the day that he was born, demanding that God meet him in the abyss of loss. He wants to justice. In this abyss, in this darkness, where he sits. I have a friend, a priest, who in his early days of priesthood was, uh, state, was in northern Ontario in a parish there. And there was a, this, an appalling um, road traffic accident in which three young boys were killed. And he was simply could not deal with it. He spiraled down into a deep and dark depression. And he spoke of that time of sitting in that darkness and then becoming aware what he believed to be the sound of breathing. And he knew it was God's presence with him there in that darkest place. And so began his healing, the slow climbing out of that dark abyss. Job's friends have words to say, words of advice, words of judgment, and theologically suspect, suspect opinions. Perhaps you have some well-meaning friends who do the same. Everything happens for a reason or in a season. God only gives us what we can bear. God wants us to get stronger, so he's inflicted us with these trials. Well, we or someone close must have done something wrong for which we must repent. Dear friends, please don't say those things to people who are grieving. Job defends his innocence and calls on God for justice. He calls on God to hear his cry when all have turned away. He rails at God. But the witness of the book of Job is that rage and even blame directed at God are valid moments in the life of faith. It is okay to yell at God. You might want to go out to a field to do it, but it is okay. <laughs> and in the midst of his terrible suffering, those beautiful words, I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold and not another. We hear them in our funeral service, though we seem to have done away with the bit that says God gives and God taketh the way. That's just too much. It's too hard to deal with. And finally, God speaks. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? So pretty similar to what Job had said to his wife. Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. That's amazing 
words, I encourage you to read them. Beautiful, poetic, but humbling. Reminding that God gave us wisdom. Important for us to read. Important for our leaders to read. And here is the turning point for Job, the recognition that God was not who he thought he was. And Job doesn't have it all figured out. And that being an upright and a righteous person does not guarantee a safe passage to the front of the line. God declares to Job and to us all that he alone made the earth, the heavens and all that is in it, the babies and the bears and the birds of paradise and the beetles, the hounds and the hummingbirds and the hippos, the crickets, the cats and the crocodiles, the raging seas, the powerful wind, the northern lights. Who would have thought of northern lights shimmering there when no, even no one can see them? So beautiful. A whole chapter in Job is devoted to God's glowing description of the Levithian, a terrifying dragon-like creature. Who'd have thought it? King over all that is proud, God declares. And Annie Dillard writes, the creator loves pizzazz. My husband and I love to go and visit zoos, and whatever you think about zoos, and I know it's mixed, it is an astonishing to see the array of creatures the creation, the pizzazz. God's words, perhaps not the words of comfort that one might have hoped, but they hear it in Job's heart. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. I heard it said that the tears of grief that clear our eyes so that we may see more clearly God's encounter with God leaves him forever changed. And he and his wife dare to start again, dare to have a family, even though they know there's no guarantee, dare to begin a life again. This extravagant and extraordinary God whose love knows no limits spreads before us the breathtaking risk of life that cannot be controlled or understood and is not free of pain. It is a book about human pain, yes, not to minimize it, not to dare to lay the responsibility at the feet of God, the feet that were nailed on the cross for us. But it's also a book about hope, learning about God, and learning from those who have walked the path. This is one of the great gifts of community. I pray that I will never have to face the horror that Job faced, and I pray for that for you too. But if I did, I think that I would seek out those who had walked that path, who knew about suffering, because they are the teachers in our community, the young and the old, the children and the grandparents. You knew that I had to get a grandparent reference in there somehow. And now that I am a grandparent, I can watch with amazement my beautiful granddaughter embracing this new life, eyes wide with amazement. But of course I worry. I can't protect her. I can't protect her from heartache. I can't protect her from hurt knees. I can't protect her from a broken heart and broken dreams or even worse. But I can pray for her. And I can see a new God's world through her her excitement and her laughter at laughter and animals and lions and probably not a Levithian, but all the wonders of God's creation laid out, created for her and for you and for me. Amen. <laughs>